Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 57 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. In today's episode of the podcast, I bring you a debate between myself and co-host Andrew Morrow of topics that were first brought up in the Clarinet community. If you've not yet joined the Clarinet community, I would like to invite you to do so, and you can do this at www.clarinet.com group. Again, that web address is www.clarinet.com group. Of course, you can also find this by searching Clarinet on Facebook, and the page should come up, which I'd like to also invite you to like, and the group should also come up. For the group, you need to request access, and if you do request to join, I will add you within 24 hours. Feel free to submit uh, pretty much any clarinet-related content that you would like to that group, and the debate day is Wednesday, so if you have anything you'd like to submit for debate topics, Wednesday is the day to do it. If this is your first time checking out the podcast, I'd like to invite you to check out the back catalog. There's over 50 interviews now, all available for free on iTunes and on the website. We've got artists like Martin Frost, Michael Lowenstern, Harry Sparnai, and Lori Friedman, just to name a few. Uh, manufacturers such as Bakun Musical Services, Clark Phobes, who of course you know designs mouthpieces and barrels, Leger Rees, Royal Musical Instruments, Viento Bamboo, many others again. Um, also an episode on hearing protection that's one of my favorites, episode 14 with Patty Johnson of Edimotic Research. Of course there's also some authors such as Emilio Garino, Seth Haynes, Jason Heath, The list just goes on and on. So if you haven't had a chance yet, delve back into some of those interviews. The summer is a great time to do it, and I do hope that you enjoy what you find. If you've been here for a while, checking out the show, listening, first of all, thank you so much. I would absolutely love it if you take a moment to leave a review on iTunes. This helps the show gain sort of notoriety in searches as people search on iTunes as a platform and helps Apple recognize it as something that's worthwhile to include in search results. Of course, if you want to help the show take place directly every month, I would really appreciate your support on Patreon. You'd be surprised how far a dollar or two goes when a large number of people pitch in. This week, I'd like to thank our latest Patreon backer, Karen P. If you'd like to check out ways you can support the podcast, please see www.clarineat.com support. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll get to Andrew and I's conversation right after a brief message from our sponsor, Dario Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com slash woodwinds. So since our last recording of the debate episode, of course, I had my accident, which I fell down the stairs and we took a few months, a few weeks off of these. But Andrew has also recently become a father. So congratulations, Andrew, to the birth of your son. Oh, thank you very much. It's been uh, very exciting. Quite the uh, whirlwind. (laughs) Are you still able to get some practice in? (laughs) Uh, Not as much as I'd like, but um, it's he's about three weeks old now and uh, I'm kind of getting back into the the swing of working most of the time back into the grind of the freelance musician lifestyle. (laughs) I guess it's more difficult than you, you might imagine because, um, I mean, during nap time, it's not like you can practice or something, but then when the the baby's awake, they need a lot of, uh, obviously assistance and attention. Right. So, yeah, well, I'm pretty, pretty lucky right now because uh, newborns will sleep like 18 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So, and when they're not sleeping, they're basically, eating. So my wife is off work right now. She's on mat leave, which is great. So, but it, it's not so much that like you got to be around them all the time. It's more like you want to be around them all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I just got to, I mean, he can sleep through just about anything. So he'll sleep through the practicing. Seriously? Um, oh yeah. But I mean like he's usually on the top floor with, hanging out with my wife and I'm on the bottom floor or sorry, in the basement practicing. Oh, but I like, see. He'll like, we'll sit there and play video games or watch TV and he'll sleep right through it. Any thoughts on an instrument for him yet? 
<laughs> uh, yes, actually. Um, I was thinking either viola or bassoon. Bassoon. Yeah, no, just because like those are like the two instruments you always like need. Like, oh man, like we we need one more violist. Does anybody know a violist for this gig? <laughs> right, like like violin out of the question. Like everybody, like flute completely out of the question. Right, like that's incredibly practical thinking. Yeah, flute players are like a dime a dozen, but uh, <laughs> right, they're, you know they're everywhere. Saxophone players too, at least in Calgary, there's a lot of saxophone players. So, you know what? This you might know. be a controversial statement, but I, I actually feel like when kids sign up for band, they actually should uh, kind of list which opportunities are available for each instrument. Like, for example, if you pick up euphonium, I really think it's important that you should know, as most kids would not know, or saxophone, um, that it's not normally used in an orchestra. Like most kids don't know that when they're picking, but if oh, their goal right. is to play in an orchestra, they really should know that, you know? Yeah, that's actually, that's really true because then they're not worry like because then they would pick trombone or clarinet instead being like oh i want to play in a symphony i shouldn't be playing picking an instrument that doesn't play in a symphony yeah exactly and i don't know how you know practical that is i suppose but i mean if i had picked um you know saxophone in that sense i think a lot of the opportunities i did have as far as getting to play with orchestras of course would not have happened right so um but uh yeah it's just an interesting sort of thought about the the selection process that should almost yeah. be a debate <laughs> mm, itself, yes and so. it, i think it goes both ways because if you you know if you pick the clarinet and you really want to play jazz well it's like you can do that but you, not really like you are going to have to play the saxophone to play j- jazz in like today's age yeah and that's so funny because back in like i don't know what is it the 20s through the 50s or something like that i guess it was yeah. kind of dying off by the 50s but but um the clarinet used to be like the band leader like they were the front man of the of the age um yeah and- especially with like uh well i think it's because it's like the soprano voice and stuff like dixieland but mm-hmm. then as as i i believe and someone can correct me if i'm wrong but as the uh trombones and trumpets became more prominent in in jazz the clarinet couldn't uh keep up with them and the rhythm section without being mic'd so as the band got larger the set the clarinet like even if you had five of them it's like just doesn't have the power that five saxophones would have in a big band setting. I heard that too. I think that, um, or I heard that the, uh, the invention of the electric guitar and the use of amplification for all instruments is kind of what pushed the clarinet off the center stage because, you know, now you've got these things, these instruments can be so loud and you're filling larger venues and, and clarinet, you know, there's ways to mic it now, but uh, I don't know why it didn't, come through better if someone knows like this is what i was just going to mention actually one of the great things about this debate episode is that everyone is commenting and and uh putting in some great feedback so if you feel like you know a lot about a topic and you want to send in some feedback uh please either do so in the clarinet community or send an email to feedback at clarinet.com and if you're not yet a member of the clarinet community make sure to head in there and join so that as these debate topics come up you can have your say and and maybe even be mentioned on an episode so Yeah. And we're always looking for more debate topics. So if you have any suggestions or things you want to see debated, please submit those as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that that would be really helpful. I mean, I, uh, I've I've come up with quite a few now. Tony's submitted a couple. Andrew, you've, you've helped out of course with a few of them. And, uh, but if people have a topic they want to see debated or a question, I think that that's a really, really, uh, I'm totally open to, to, you know, featuring listener questions in that way as well. So anyways, should we get started? Yeah, why not? So the first debate question that we're going to talk about today was every clarinetist should read blank. Um, and I don't think that I was actually very clear with this. So what happened is people, my mom actually chimed in and said they should read music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not what I meant, mom. <laughs> I actually didn't even know she was in the community. So that's very interesting. Um, but uh, and other people said, you know, the Behrman etudes, the Rose etudes, etc. But what I meant was what is a book of prose? that every clarinet just should read. And, um, first off, what was your, what was your thought on that, Andrew? Um, well, I think there is a ton of stuff out there. And one thing I thought was um, pretty interesting is after we got through the music suggestions, which that might actually be another good debate topic, Mm -hmm. um, was, um, there was, seems to be a mix of books about like specifically about music or specifically about the clarinet and a, a selection of books that were not about the clarinet. Like, so, um, we had one, a uh, person write in and suggest uh, reshaping thoughts by uh, Weinberg. Mm-hmm. 
Actually, that uh, is the author. He, oh, he, that is the author. <laughs> yeah, Anton Weinberg. I'm, I'm going to have him on eventually here, I think. He'd be a oh, great awesome. guest. Absolutely. But yeah, that was his. So he talks about um, sort of uh, uh, the book is called The Problem is the Solution. Or no, sorry, reshape, Reshaping Thoughts, The Problem is the Solution. And uh, he says it's been used by a, a lot of different scholars. And yeah. um, I'd love to get my hands on a copy of that, actually. Yeah, he specifically says it's been on the recommended reading list for presidential scholars, which is, uh, that's quite... Uh, wow. Yeah, that's quite the, you know, line item on your resume. That is very cool. Yeah, and uh, championed by uh, the famous Ricardo Morales, which is uh, it's a good recommendation for clarinet players. Absolutely. He says that uh, Hans Keller and Jack Brimer helped with its development, which is also very interesting. Yeah, but I'd be uh, I'd be actually interested in reading that as well. It would be kind of cool because I uh, I heard an interest kind of ties into this interesting thing I heard about like you know when you work for somebody like mm-hmm. like you can be a pretty terrible employee if all you do is bring them problems, right? And so, but you can set yourself apart from the other employees if you bring them solutions, right? So mm-hmm. there's like an obvious problem. I mean, I think your solutions they don't have to be good, but if you're like you go to your boss and you're like, hey, this issue has arisen. I have these three different things we can do about it. What do you think, right? And you know, maybe your boss is like, those are all terrible. I want you to do mine instead. But at least you like had, came with something, right? So yeah, I like that. The problem is the solution. But uh, yeah, we had another um, a very famous uh, book, uh, the Inner Game of Tennis, and its uh, partner, the Inner Game of Music. Now, do do you know? Wasn't there also like an Inner Game of Motorcycle Repair? Oh, <laughs> the art right. of motor, the art and Zen of motorcycle maintenance. Oh, that's, that's a different what I'm book. Thinking. That's a different book. But you know, yeah. this has been on my reading list for. A long time because our professor in university, Glenn D. Price, who also just released his own book on conducting, which I have and I need to read. It's uh, quite lengthy and involved with the full like DVD lesson series. Anyways, quite interested. Haven't had the time. Um, but when I was at Midwest this year, actually, I purchased a copy of The Inner Game of Music for myself, finally. And it is in my line of books to read. And I, I really can't wait to get to it. And uh, thank you for uh, Kimberly for submitting that. I think that... Um, it does sound like something everyone should read. I just, I can't vouch for it yet. Have you read it? Uh, no, but um, another good one along the same lines of those is This Is Your Brain on Music. Mm. It's supposed to be very good. But the cool thing I heard about the inner game of tennis is like, you know, like as you develop a skill, the pathways in your brain, like, and I think the best like metaphor is simply for it is, you know, it's like you start to learn how to do like a tennis serve, right? And the pathway in your brain that is, that executes that, it's like a dirt road, right? The neuron that's firing along that is the car and it can't go very fast because it's this terrible road. But the more neurons, the more cars that drive on that road, it gets upgraded and it gets paved. And now those neurons can fire a little faster, mm-hmm. right? And then like, so more neurons are firing and then they double lane that and more neurons are firing. And eventually like this keeps going until that pathway in your brain is the equivalent of a super highway and the neurons can just zip down that like they're zipping down the autobahn. And so you can actually execute your tennis serve faster than you can actually think about it Hmm. where it becomes so like instinctual, which I think is the concept behind muscle memory. And so the other interesting trick to that is if you're playing tennis against someone who's really good at serving, you ask them, man, how do you serve so well? And then they'll actually think about the actions of the serve and they'll mess up the serve because they can execute the actions faster by not thinking about it. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because as musicians, I feel like that is really our task, especially when it comes to being able to play in certain scales, for example. And this is why when students get beyond a pretty young age, I mean, for the first little while, I'll let them, you know, mark the accidentals with a highlighter or something if they really need it. But you have to get rid of that really quickly because the point of learning to play in D major, for example, is to remember your two sharps automatically. Yeah, and you just, your brain goes into D major and just happens. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe for a kid who's just learning the concept, they need a little reminder, but pretty much anybody else, like you've got to just be able to do that. And I think that it's, it's one of the, the biggest flaws with, uh, uh, you know, marking up music, for example, sometimes you see people who've circled all the, all the little naturals and st- or sharps, I mean, and it's just like, oh man, you don't really know what you're doing here. Do you? <laughs> yeah, you clearly don't know your scales. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, there, there was a few other books I wanted to mention from my own collection that mm-hmm. I think, um, our listeners might be interested in. Uh, the first one is The Clarinet Doctor by Howard Klug, mm. Klug, Klug, K-L-U-G. And uh, this book I find really interesting. 
um, it is a lot of written stuff and it's just kind of like, it's, I was really good for like new students cause it kind of talks about like how to practice. And then he has like lots of examples about stuff to practice. And then he just like, it's mostly reading about the various things that you do, you know, like how to breathe, how to tongue, but you're, you're reading about it. So I think it's really good and like reads and stuff. It's really good for those uh, learners who like need that, right? Like they can look at pictures of where your tongue is supposed to go and they can practice it all they want. But like, if they just read a description of it, they'll uh, like might be much more successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another book that actually was suggested, um, by, uh, Brian Shee, and thanks for suggesting this is the art of clarinet playing by Keith Stein. And it's kind of the same thing. He talks about the read, the clarinet, how to make a swab, how to form an embouchure, you know, how important relaxation is, breathing and support, uh, tone. And he's got a couple exercises in here, not very many, but mostly, again, just reading about how to play the clarinet. And one thing, he in this book, he talks about the double lip embouchure, which we don't really see anymore. Um, I haven't read that one. That would be interesting for me because I am curious about it. And, and the one I like, um, I think it's called The Clarinet and Clarinet Playing. Um, I think it's David Pinot. Um, oh, Yes. Yeah, that's another good one. I'd have to check the author on that. I, I can't remember right now. And uh, I, I think, oh, here it is. It is David Pino, and it's the clarinet and clarinet playing. I pulled it out for today. This is, yeah, this one is quite lengthy, whereas those first two are are quite short. But uh, yeah, the Pino book is is very good. Have you read the Clarinetist Compendium by Daniel Bernard? Um, I have that one. That, um, it's not with me. I think it's buried on my shelf somewhere. But that is a good one. And that one, it's uh, it's like the club, right? Where it's like half um, writing about the clarinet and then half, the other half like exercises and etudes. Yeah, I really like that one because it's also super concise. Like it doesn't require you to sit down and, and read it for, you know, a week. You can kind of just get through it. And the, 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 the concepts are really easily kind of even just shown to a student. Like, look, this is the, <laughs> the text, uh, a text anyways, of something you could check in. And you can just lend it to a student. They can read it before the next lesson kind of thing, you know, and, and get some of the, the thoughts in there. So, Yeah. Um, another one that I'm a big fan of is the Thomas Ridnour, The Educator's Guide to the Clarinet. Uh, I want uh, that one. I don't have it, though. Oh man, it's, it's so good. I, for me, I would consider this a must have for anyone who's like finishing their undergrad and like starting to teach lessons. Cause there's, there's just so many things that you forget about learning, right? Like, mm-hmm. like, and, and until you start teaching people how to do it, you're like, Oh man, like I forgot how to learn how to tongue. Right. Or maybe, you know, you're really fortunate and there's something that comes really naturally to you. And that's really, it's really hard to teach things that are easy for you. Right. Like, you know, they always say like, well, it's like the, you know, when it comes to like rehab, it's always like the addicts or the former addicts that make the best counselors. Uh Right. So it's like, you know, if you had to overcome some obstacle with your tonguing, you're going to have a really easy time teaching your students how to overcome that same obstacle. But if it came naturally to you. And so this book is really good because it just goes over like all the different concepts and some ways to teach them and just some ways to even just think about them. Well, that kind of goes back to what you're saying, too, about the the inner game of music thing, like when you have to go back and think about what it is you're doing. Um, that's where the problem almost comes from. You know, I just looked online here on Amazon cause I thought that after we got off the call here, I should order myself a copy of that written hour. So on amazon.ca, that book, I don't know why is selling for $846. Whoa. I don't understand. And then, so the clarinet fingerings book by written hour, which I also have. About that's 10, a great book. I have about 10 copies of it in stock. So it's, you know, I, I so anyways, on <laughs> Amazon.ca, <laughs> $1,700. What's going on? Whoa. This is Wow, what? maybe it's out of print. I don't think so. I mean, I, I think I'm selling the ones on the Clarinet store for 22, so I expect them to sell out after this. But <laughs> I should check Amazon.com. I can't understand these prices. I mean, it, it must be just like the second-hand retailers, you know, or like crazy. the third-party retailers. It says but, one used from one thousand seven hundred dollars, one new from two thousand one hundred and fifty dollars. What is going on? I should, that is unbelievable. Wow. I, I should definitely look into this. So, yeah. I mean, your choice is, do you want to upgrade your instrument or do you want to copy of this book? I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that's is bizarre. Great. Yeah. I have just a couple more books I want to uh, go over. For um, sure, yeah. A couple for anyone who's playing the bass clarinet. Harry Sparney's book, uh, The Bass Clarinet of Personal History, is a must. Oh, this yes. This book, like he covers like the history of the bass clarinet like quite shortly um, and then his whole life with the bass clarinet, which, you know, if you play the bass clarinet, then you should know the name Harry Sparney. 
and know how important he is. But then the other thing that's great about this book is he goes through all of the extended techniques that are so common on the bass clarinet. And he talks about programming a concert and repertoire and just like tons of resources. It's like hands down the number one most important book for any bass clarinetist to have. And then this one isn't so much a book, but this one is a, it's a DMA thesis written by Thomas Aber, who I believe he comments a lot on the, um, on the community but his thesis is spectacular. Um, it's not overly long-winded. Let me look here. It's 167 pages, hmm. um, eight and a half by 11, written in like 12 fonts. So it's, um, but yeah, it's it's the most concise history of the bass clarinet. So if you wanted to know, like, you know, the first opera that used the bass clarinet and its development. So what's the full title? Uh, a history of the bass clarinet as an orchestral and solo instrument in the 19th and early 20th centuries and an annotated chronological list of solo repertoire for the bass clarinet before 1945. Hmm. Yeah, really spectacular. Um, I don't really know how to go about getting your hands on a DMA thesis, but it's probably on JSTOR or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, yeah, so getting away from like, um, you know, method books or books about how to play the clarinet, you know, where to put, how to form your embouchure and stuff. Um, I really like, have you read any of Pamela Weston's books? The like uh, clarinet virtuosi of the past, more clarinet virtuosi of the past, yesterday's clarinetists, a sequel, uh, heroes and heroines of clarinetry and clarinet virtuosi of today. Are you reading these from your bookshelf? Uh, I pulled them off my bookshelf, but I'm looking at quite the library there. I got to come over and steal some of your books. Oh, geez. Yeah, (laughs) maybe. But, um, yeah, so these five books written by Pamela West and unfortunately before, uh, she, she, uh, she died, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, she was, she was extremely sick. And, uh, so she went to, uh, over to Europe, um, for, uh, physician assisted suicide because of her ailments were just too much for her, which is very sad. Mm -hmm. But um, the clarinet virtuosi of today is a very hard book to get your hand on because it is out of print. But she, because she, uh, she decided it wasn't really accurate anymore, which I think that's a little silly because I mean like, so what like each of these books does is there's just like mini chapters dedicated to all of the famous clarinetists, right? Like, you know, we, we often hear about famous violinists and opera singers and pianists, but we don't really get to hear about famous clarinetists. Yeah. Which is cool. So like in this first one, there's a chapter on Anton Stadler, which, uh, naturally. And what else we got? No, that's sorry. The plates. Where's the table of contents? That's just the pictures. Where's the, Oh, I missed it. Hang on. Here we go. So the master of music from London, Mr. Charles, sponsored the clarinet. Uh, The first virtuosi, Stadler, of course. Um, The clarinetist at the court of Saundershausen um, and like other stuff like that. So all these like super famous, like the famous clarinetists from around, you know, Bach and Mozart and the early uh, romantic period. And then like, so all the books just kind of do that. Uh, Heroes of Her- and Heroines of Clarinetistry is a, is a good one as well. It's kind of more of like a, a summary of the other famous uh, clarinetists. Spore is in here, which is which is awesome. Wow. Uh, it talks about Beethoven's clarinetists. Um, so what's your secret about- to building a great clarinet library then? Because you've got a ton of books here. I, I'm I'm surprised I don't have as nearly as many. Um, I just, my, uh, my teacher just one day start like in my undergrad, she was like, you know, you're in your third year. It's time to, she's like, you gotta be buying music. Right. Like, and I think now it's even harder because, you know, like if you want the Mozart concerto, you, you're not like, I mean, honestly, right now, if I have a student who's playing the Mozart concerto and they're like, where would I go find music? I would be like, yeah, go check IMSLP. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you get like this photocopy, like print off of the Mozart concerto. Whereas like my teacher was like, if you're going to play a piece of music or if you're even just interested and you want to look at a go look at a piece of music, you go out and buy it. I was like, Oh, okay. So like, I mean, I have, I have music. I've like only ever played in my practice room or stumbled through like the Copeland concerto. Cause you know, that thing is a monster. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess it's just kind of the same with, with books is, um, I also think a part of it was when I was going to school, um, I had about a 45 minute commute every day back and forth. So an hour and a half total. And I would dedicate that to reading 
right? Like not like not reading my history books, for, like not reading my re- assigned reading materials, but just reading whatever I wanted to read, right? So I read a lot of fiction, but then I also read a lot of these like clarinet books and a couple of these other like things that were like related to music, but they were kind of off a little bit. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, if you to our, our listeners, if you can get your hands on a copy of Clarinet Virtuosity of today, this one is spectacular. I'll just go through some of the, like, there's just a ton of clarinetists in here. But, like, to give you an example of some of them, we got James Campbell, Larry Combs, um, Stanley Drucker, Joseph Horak, uh, Thea King, uh, Mitchell Lurie, or Lurie, Lurie, I'm not sure yeah. exactly how that's pronounced, but Sabine Meyer, Charles Nydick, um, like, ha- most of these guys are still alive. David Schifrin, Harry Sparne, Richard Stoltzman, wow. like, yeah, so I don't know why she got upset about the, the title. Like, that was the only one I read about why it was, di- like, discontinued. So where have you acquired these rare books? And just Amazon or? or- um, okay, so this one is, I, I don't really condone or support, like, okay, so I bought all the other ones. because, And, you know, they're relatively cheap. They were, like, maybe, like, 20, 25 bucks each. Mm-hmm. But um, the clarinet virtuosi of today, I, I, I wouldn't do this for any other book, but only because this book was impossible to get is I borrowed it uh, through an interlibrary loan mm-hmm. when I was uh, going to the University of Calgary, and then I photocopied the whole thing one page at a time. Oh, my God. Quite the yeah. task. Yeah, but, I mean, it's definitely – I think it was definitely worth it. Well, yeah, it's the only way if something's completely out of print and gone, though. I mean – Yeah. So, interesting. Yeah, and then I, I just have four more books before we end this topic. I know there's kind of a lot. <laughs> oh, my Lord. But, uh, no, this, this one is super important. For um, It's called Writing About Music, The Style Sheet from the Editors of 19th Century Music by uh, D. Kern Holloman. It's an extremely thin book, but it just kind of talks about how to properly, like, you know, like one of my favorite, like how to properly write a title of a piece of music, right? Or how to properly write a, a book title when you're talking about about a book or like um, it's kind of just the style guide for that particular journal, but mm-hmm. it's kind of become like the standard. So like there's this little chapter here on not using Britishisms, which or which is what we use in Canada, like favor. You wouldn't spell with an O same with color or endeavor or honors. Yeah. Um, right. Like avoid British music terminology, like uh, gramophone, crotchet and quaver um, stuff like that. Like some other weird, um, sp- American spelling. So like if you're not American, this is, um, really, really helpful. And it also sh- shows you like how to properly make a program, which is really important because, you know, if you want your program to look professional, you want it to look like everyone else's program and this thing will tell you about it. Um, the other two books are both written by Alex Ross. Uh, the rest is noise is probably in my opinion, the better one but it's subtitled listening to music in the 20th century. Now this guy is the, uh, music critic for the New Yorker Mm -hmm. and he has, uh, some really cool, um, ideas about modern music, um, which is definitely, so not really about the clarinet, but just about music in general, but that's a very good book. And then his sequel to that, which is called listen to this, where he kind of goes along, keeps going down the, the same thing, uh, the same idea about concepts in modern music that, You know, not like things like serialism or uh, spectralism, but just more things um, for the, I guess, like average listener to help them grasp or kind of connect to the music a little better or understand like what the purpose of the art is. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, which I've only read a little bit of of this, but I think um, it's still interesting reading, but it's called, uh, it's by uh, Adorno and it's called Philosophy of New Music. Which is, is a good so – some people either tend to love Adorno or hate Adorno. But he's, he's got some weird concepts. Uh, I guess he's, he's maybe like the Ayn Rand of new music philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe not quite as polarizing yeah. with, the, with the general public. So he talks a lot about Schoenberg and Stravinsky and, and stuff like that. But yeah, that's uh, – anyway, so that's my little list of recommended readings. So combine Andrew's list with the uh, the list from everybody else that is on there. I, I don't ever want to hear anyone saying they have nothing to read again. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be at least 20 books we just ran off. So oh, the yeah. uh, next couple of years of reading for, for most people. So, <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for commenting on that, everybody. And, um, wow, that is a lot of books to read. I'll do my best to link to as many of those as possible in the show notes page. And so you can search for this episode on clarinet.com. 
Um, the next topic, which this was speaking of polarizing topics, this one was really polarizing, um, was when you play the clarinet, what is your concept of the airstream? Is it hot or cold and why? Um, you know, I, I was surprised that this really started as much conversation as it did. Um, but the reason I thought this would be an interesting topic is because I had always been taught cold and fast. Um, and then I was at a oh. master class with Frank Cohen and he mentioned that he felt the Airstream should be, you know, quite strongly he felt the Airstream should be warm. And he also seemed to put more emphasis on the breath in than the breath out. He said they were, or he sort of, I felt that he meant or said that they were one in the same almost. Like when I asked him to sort of di differentiate, he he didn't really want to. He felt that they were kind of a unity, um, which makes sense to me actually. But, warm and um, fast? No, you sorry. In, the in and out of the breath is almost the oh, same. Right. Is almost the same, and and it's it's. I understand kind of what he means, but any anyway. So, but for me, I was always taught this sort of cold, fast air. But it's come to mind that maybe we're actually describing two things, but in the different places in the body that it happens. Like, I I, I now describe the airstream like if I was teaching a student, I would say it comes from a warm place, like your diaphragm. You've got to get that sort of <sighs> kind of hot um, sensation. But in the embouchure, it speeds up. You know, the embouchure oh, yeah. focuses the air. So it comes from a hot place, but it becomes cool. So what's your thought on that? Um, this is interesting. I've always done the the kind of warm and fast, but it's it's not really so much about the air when I teach students this. It's more about getting their or the right shape of their oral cavity. So like if like yes. the trick I always do is like if you hold your hand in front of your mouth and like this is usually for like, you know, 14 year olds, you know, breathe warm air and they're all like, Ah, you know, like, yeah. like they're fogging up a window in your in their parents car in the middle of the winter. Right. And it's like, okay, so what'd you have to do to get the warm air? And it's like, Oh, well I had like, everything was very open. It's like, all right, excellent. Now get cold air. Right. And then they get, they go, right. They get like the tiny little opening and they blow the air out as fast as they can. And that gets cold air. So then my next question is like, all right, so do you guys think you could get warm and fast air? Right. And then it causes them to get everything open in the, inside their mouth. But then, Right, like, but then their mouth is closed, quite closed, like it would be if they were playing their instrument. And you know that that's kind of where I'm at too. Is I think that the air, you know, needs to come from a warm place because that's just the nature of blowing from your diaphragm. Um, but and you know, this is one thing that drives me nuts about music is sometimes it's so unscientific. Like no one is saying the air should be exactly. 36 degrees, you know, <laughs> I mean, no one is saying that. And, and by the way, I'm talking Celsius people. I'm not crazy because <laughs> 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 body temperature, I think is what 37. So it makes sense for the air to be slightly cooler or warmer anyways. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's no way if you think about it, that the, the, the air could physically be hotter than body temperature. So, yeah. I mean, what does it even mean to say that our air should be hotter or colder? I mean, is this, are we all just describing the wrong thing? You know, like, are I, we, I think, I think we are. Yeah. I think you're onto something there think, with, with discussing the embouchure shape and, and that. Like, and, sorry. Sorry. I'm just like thinking about like blowing the air and like, if you change the aperture in your mouth, it changes the temperature of the air. But I actually think like, cause you're feeling it on your hand, but I think what this is, is you're just experiencing wind chill. Right? Yes, Cause like exactly you, around your body, there's like this bubble of warm air that you're like giving off. And as that warmth goes out into the rest of the air, it cools down to, I guess, room temperature, whatever that happens to be, it's, wherever it's you are. It's kind of like when you grab a metal object and then a plastic object, one feels colder because it's taking heat more readily from your body, you know? Yeah. So I think when you're blowing warm air, right? Like, I don't think it's the air temperature. I think it's the speed in which it's passing your hand and it's picks up the warmth and take carries the like carries the warmth away from your hand. Well, and I can imagine some people listening right now and going, "Of course, that's what it means." But but the problem is, is that like, <laughs> <laughs> the problem is though is like that's not actually really what it means because in music we tend to say things like definitively, like you should use warm air or you should use cold air or you should do X. But it's completely like I said, unobjective, unscientific, and. I almost feel that maybe this whole concept um, should instead be directed towards something like air speed or air pressure or or the the aperture in which the air is moving through um, instead. Because whether we all like it or not, that is really what we're describing, right? Yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah, it's definitely not like the actual temperature, but what, what we're doing to change how we perceive the temperature. Exactly. So when someone says they play with cold, fast air, I mean... 
the, how are they chilling the air in their body before they <laughs> before they blow it out? Like, <laughs> you get, a, you get an ice, a couple of like ice cubes and just tuck them into your cheeks. Exactly. So yeah, I can see the concept of just like you said, the the, the air feels cold in your palm, but it's coming from a warm place from your diaphragm. So, but yeah, it's a very interesting concept. And uh, a lot of people chiming in either said cold or hot. Nobody said in between and nobody gave an exact answer. <laughs> yeah, that was very, yeah, very yeah. interesting. So Anton Weinberg actually chimed in here again. He says it's equivalent to the bow of the violin and c- capable of all the same nuances particularly slow and fast air, similar to bowing techniques. Taking a breath is also equivalent to the retake of the bow. Interestingly, Brahms clarinetist Mühlfeld, oh, sorry, I should say that again. Brahms's clarinetist Mühlfeld was originally leader of the orchestra and a superb violinist. So he's drawing a, a, an association between the physicality of moving the violin bow and blowing the air, which is difficult for me because I don't play violin at all. Yeah, I've actually I've used that like relating things to string, string instruments a lot be, uh, with students because I feel like if you look at a string instrument and I think I think violin and or any string teacher are they're really lucky in this respect like because we can't see as wind pl- in- teachers we can't see the inside of a student's mouth we don't know what their tongue position is we don't know mm-hmm. if their tongue's actually hitting the reed or if they're doing some like really great way of faking it right but like with the violin you can just everything is right there and you can see it. Right. Which I think might make it a little bit easier to teach. Yes. Right. Not saying that they don't have to listen as much as we do, but, you know, like diagnosing like a problem with the tongue. Are they tonguing with the flap? Like, are they tonguing with the tip of the tongue or the flat part of their tongue? Is their tongue hitting their lip? Right. Are they doing something completely different? Like, who knows? But um, so, like, I often like will put like when thinking about like a staccato, I think about try to get students to think about, you know, the way I was string instrument, even like a guitar or ukulele, it doesn't have to be a classical or like a orchestral string instrument. But when you pluck it, right, there's that big initial sound. Mm-hmm. And then there's like this little bit of sound that lingers on. And so I like to kind of get students to think about staccatos like that so that they're not like kind of cutting off the air with their tongue. But I, I do really like, yeah, comparing it and to Sorry, the- Weinberg also goes on later to say that what concerns him about the whole conversation, and maybe even this conversation, is that none of the people commenting had mentioned any relationship to the method and the music. And and in a way, I agree. Like, here we are again kind of debating this concept completely outside of its practical use, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think that music could benefit a little bit from becoming a little more focused on what it's doing and and almost becoming scientific in the process. And and Adam Momo actually comments, thanks for this, Adam. He kind of says what we were just saying, but he thinks more of a tight, fast airstream and not if it's hot or cold. And and based yeah. on what we just mentioned, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think everyone agrees that fast air was important. I don't think anybody said anything about slow air. Yeah, I think it's almost about the focus of the air too, because that's, for example, for a younger student, when they first sound really edgy, um, it's often because they're overpowering, they're using too much air. And as they learn how to focus it and play with less that's faster, you get a sweeter, rounder tone, right? Um, Yeah. So I think that there's a lot to be said for learning how to control the note as it affects things like the articulation, like you were saying, or Weinberg there with the bowing. I mean, how does the air affect the the note if it's sudden, if it's easing in, if it's if it's a lot of air, if it's less, if it's tighter, looser, warmer, colder, whatever you want to call it. I mean, how do these things affect the resulting sound? And maybe we should start there instead of with the the air temperature. So, An yeah, interesting I, topic for sure. Yeah, I like that thinking about the results and what you're getting on your clarinet, not what you're doing on your clarinet. Well, yeah, I think we're all trying to describe the same thing, but using a method that maybe doesn't make sense. So maybe this, in in all honesty, was a bad debate question. Um, but the fact of the matter is that I know that people have opinion about this topic because um, not only from the results generated, but this is a common, commonly discussed thing, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I feel like we've kind of fleshed that out. What do you think? I think I think we've covered everything we can about hot and cold and slow and fast air. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, if you have any sort of thoughts on that, again, please just uh, do comment on this. I would be really interested if someone could tune in, especially if someone actually knows more about like I, I don't imagine the air is physically colder. But if we if we made a mistake or something, please, please do correct us. <laughs> so so the next two questions and uh, they're actually kind of related, but are, are about the materials of of 
clarinets and then the materials of ligatures and the type of ligatures. So the first question, though, is which clarinet material do you like your clarinet to be made out of? Why or why not? And uh, this could be really any the grenadilla wood, rosewood, cocobolo, plastic, uh, hard rubber, um, or even a metal, carrot. carrot yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you know what what do you prefer? It's made out of, and why? What are some of the differences and and benefits? Um, this one didn't generate a huge amount of discussion, but we should still just touch on it quickly. Yeah, one thing I found um, interesting uh, comment by James Sullivan, um, and I think there's a lot of subtext to this comment, but he says depends if you want stable dimensions or are just looking to hop on whatever bandwagon is loading up that particular half decade. So, I mean, I think we've definitely seen a huge rise in Coca-Cola clarinets and barrels and bells in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, especially. And not, now, not to say that they're not they're not good. Um, I've had personal problems with uh, Coca-Cola where, where we live in, in Alberta, um, especially, or specifically Calgary. Our weather is extremely temperamental, and it goes up and down all the time, which is a huge effect on our reeds and our clarinets. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have not had any success with Coco Bolo um, stuff. Like I find like, and it's just like, we're like something like 10 centimeters of precipitation a year uh, away from being a de classified a desert. So it's like, like it's so dry and like our weather is just up and down all the time. And so I find the Coco Bolo, one, it shrinks a lot like all, all wooden clarinets will shrink here or all wooden instruments will shrink over time because of how dry it is mm -hmm. but the coco bolo i find because it's a less dense wood it shrinks really quickly um and also is more prone to cracking well i i don't know I, i've heard this argument before too and i i do have to kind of like in a way i kind of agree that yes i, I think that these woods are becoming more trendy but i think that part of it is due to technological advancements that are allowing them to be used more effectively um, better quality wood, uh, the treatment process is better. And honestly, for someone who lives in a climate that allows it, I don't see why, if that's the sound that they prefer, for example, or the feel or whatever, I don't see why they shouldn't use it. So I, I, I'm sort of where with the wood material or whatever, I'm kind of at where I'm at with the reeds. I don't really, in a way, it's kind of a weird debate topic because it's such a personal choice and I don't really see how one person using a certain type of clarinet really <laughs> directly affects another person. But it is true that the, the Coca Bolo for me anyways, up here in Calgary has been difficult. I, I had a, I have a couple of Coca Bolo barrels actually. And, uh, uh, one of them is a, a Phobes rubber lined and even that one managed to crack. And, oh uh, man. You know, That's so Forbes was great about it. He replaced it for me, but he also mentioned like, and we even talked about this in the podcast episode. He said like, look, I mean, it's just so dry up there. This wood is not, is not the ideal solution for you because it's simply not as dense and it's just the temperature and the dryness up there is just nuts. So, um, but, uh, so Grenadilla has become so popular because it is so dense. And of course it also has that nice dark appearance. Um, and this is, it's actually rather interesting because I heard, and I don't know if this is entirely true, but I heard that one reason that as plastic and synthetic clarinets came to be, the reason they were colored black is so that they would appear more like that dark, rich grenadilla that had become so popular. So maybe had clarinets been made out of some other wood like cocobolo or boxwood or whatever from the beginning, they might have been colored reddish in the plastic. Oh, that's pretty, that's interesting. And, you know. Grenadilla only really caught on because back then the technological advancements were, were, you know, as far as like keeping them humidified and all those sorts of things, I think they weren't quite as, as, as good. And so I feel like that wood caught on simply because it's so dense and durable and not necessarily because it sounds the best. That is interesting. I, I've heard that, that I've heard another debate that not like one of our clarinet debates, but an argument that the material Cause like, it's like, unlike a, like a violin where like, I think like the wood is creating the resonating, um, box mm -hmm. on the clarinet. It's the air that's re that's vibrating and creating, creating all of the sound. Um, so the material of the clarinet doesn't actually matter, which is why we see these Coca Bola clarinets and Grenadilla and green lines and other, and plastic clarinets that can sound as good as a wooden clarinet. Yeah. I heard this too. I don't, remember where this was but I actually they took it a step further when I whatever I read and they actually mentioned that and this is going to go a little over um, some people's heads I might have to explain this I think but <laughs> are, you, are you familiar with fractal geometry 
Uh, I'm familiar with fractals. So basically, uh, fractal geometry is, um, well, the idea of the fractal was from Benoit Mandelbrot. I'll put a link in, in the show notes to this. But so basically what fractal, um, what you can do is you can measure the roughness of a surface, right? So like a completely smooth table might appear to be flat, but it actually has a little bit of sort of a, a, a roughness to it. But the imperfection is in a, is a fractal. Um, you could calculate it, you know? Oh, okay. So, Basically, one argument that I read was that the the difference between materials, for example, uh, plastic, which is very smooth inside, and wood, which actually is slightly porous, um, this the fractal geometry of the roughness of the surface is what allows the air to vibrate differently in the tube, and that's what gives the effective difference. And I thought that was really interesting. Oh. Um, but you know, it's so weird because I, I you mentioned that the clarinet body does not vibrate. It, it's odd because in a way. Like I can feel the vibrations when I put my fingers down, but I guess that's perhaps just the air coming up through the hole. Then, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm just. This is just what I heard. I, I'm not yeah, saying yeah. No, I don't that know the body either. doesn't vibrate. So if somebody does have a, a source that could show us one way or the other, that would be awesome to share that. Well, because one thought is then, okay, well, why couldn't I just attach a clarinet mute like to my bell, like you could with a. Like, oh, like if, the if, silent brass? Yeah, if the clarinet was, well, no, I mean like a violin, like they put the little mute, uh, on oh, the, you know. Right, yeah. If I plug my sound hole on my acoustic guitar, um, not much sound is coming out. Yeah. But on the clarinet, like if I attach or a little rag or something to the bell, I mean, there's a sense to which the it's maybe no longer as free and resonant, but I don't think it's affecting the volume. So. Yeah, yeah unless you were on like those bottom notes, which would be. Yeah. So we're kind of going on a tangent here, but yeah. the, uh, the thing is, is that I, I think that I heard too, that when metal clarinets were popular, um, they actually were used even by symphony players. And oh, crazy. Well, if you think about it, I mean, how bad of a material could metal really be? I mean, all saxophones and all brass instruments are made out of metal. And yeah, that's true. You know, one benefit of metal is that it heats up right away. And you're in tune in, in, you know, a matter of seconds instead of many minutes. And with a clarinet, the inside or the, the material is not only dense, but thick. Um, whereas with the Which, metal, it, it conducts heat readily and it is much thinner. This also presents a problem if you're in the winter in a harsh climate is now your clarinet takes even longer to warm up before you can even start playing it. And the problems of warming it up are more pronounced because on the outside, it's very cold and the inside you blow that warm air. That's what's caused... That's what causes the cracking, right? Yeah. Um, well, we can't get away without mentioning uh, synthetics or half synthetics. Um, mm -hmm. I know the green lines are very popular. I have a, a green line. Uh, my B-flight clarinet is a green line. And I I have mixed feelings about it because like, I think the sound is a little bright. Um, Tony Park had mentioned um, them specifically and said they're great if you travel a lot or live in uh, regions of extreme climate climates and he says some of them sound really great which is i couldn't agree with him more i think i think mine's a little on the brighter side and mm -hmm. if i were i mean realistically if i were to buy a new set of clarinets i would probably get all green lines just because like they're they're safe they're reliable i don't have to worry about them but like i mean i would also you know if you're looking to spend you know upwards of ten thousand dollars on clarinets and let's just say for to make my point nice and easy if i was to buy buffet clarinets which, I mean, that's probably likely anyway. But, um, you know, if I'm going to spend $10,000 on a set of buffet clarinets or even seven, right, uh, you know, I might as well just spend a couple hundred bucks on a plane ticket down to Jacksonville in Florida where the factory or the storehouse is to try up, try them out. Like it just yeah. to me like that would just make sense. Like, like, no, I'm not going to try to get like my local music store, no matter how big they are, they're not going to bring in five B flat clarinets and five A clarinets. I mean, they're not even going to bring in two, right? Yeah. They may be like, we'll bring in one maybe, and we're not going to, and you have to pay for it first. So it's like, well, for a couple hundred bucks, fly down there. But um, one thing Tony mentioned about them is that their downfall is well, they don't crack, which that I can attest to that. I had to do a gig with a country singer a while ago. And um, he was like, got, stuck in like a big traffic jam outside of the city. So he basically rolled in to town like 10 minutes before the gig started. And we rehearsed uh, under an overhang in the alley behind the bar while it was <laughs> raining. Yeah. I was like, man, I've never been so happy to have a green line clarinet. Yeah. Um, 
So he said they're quite brittle, and he's heard of many instances where the upper joint breaks off. Now, I, I did have a friend in my undergrad who dropped her her, her green line like twice, and both times she dropped it, it, it broke to some degree. But I mean, like, don't drop your clarinet, maybe. You know, I understand, like, if it, like, if it falls, it might take some damage. But, you know, if you do drop your clarinet, you, it's kind of like dropping your iPhone, right? If you drop your iPhone, you can only get so upset that the screen cracks. Yeah, because it's, it's made of glass or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, um, I've, like, I've never had a problem with my, my green line. Um, so well, I, and, I'd and, you be know, the way that extreme forces affect things can't always be determined. And it would make sense to me that, that the green line um, doesn't break in the same way as normal would, because in a way that's the point, right? It's, yeah. <laughs> it's not going to crack along the grain. It's going to, with a high force, potentially just snap off, which, you know, I have seen that too. Someone I, I knew dropped theirs and uh, it broke off. But again, I mean, it, it you dropped it. <laughs> it's broken. Yeah. Yeah, and then I I think the other type of clarinet we're kind of we haven't mentioned on. Well, I think you hinted at it with your rubber lined mm -hmm. um, barrel is the I believe Yamaha like the way Buffet has like the green line is their thing. Yamaha's response to that I believe is the duet clarinets, which I believe it's an intermediate model clarinet, but it's a, a wooden clarinet and the inside of the bore is plastic, so it's that plastic lined thing again. Is it plastic or rubber? Um, I'm not sure which actually. Um, I'd have to look into that. It could be rubber. It might be plastic. Okay. I have no idea. Yeah, but, I should um, double check that because I, I think that – what's the model? Do you know what they're called? Uh, um, it's the, just the Duet. Duet, okay. It's a clever name in a way. They're sort of mating the two materials as one. Oh, they're yeah. A duet together, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I, I have yet to try one of those, although I am interested. I've had great success with the uh, – one thing I like about the, the, the Clark Phobes rubber line barrel, for example. I, I'm sure other manufacturers are also doing a rubber lining. Um, so, I mean, James had mentioned some uh, inconsistency with the the material, Cocobolo or something. Um, and this – helps to remedy that problem. I mean, rubber is incredibly stable and oh, absolutely. it is not changing in, in any way, really. Uh, and if the wood were deemed to be changing too much, I mean, that is of course going to lead to tuning instabilities. So I find that that does actually really a nice thing for the, the barrel. But then, you know, you make me wonder with, with the comment about, you know, does the clarinet actually physically vibrate? Um, yeah, well, is I mean, the wood like, then, is the wood then just for show? Like, <laughs> yeah, or I mean, like, I've done like the occasional, um, you know, clinic with like grade five, six, or seven students, and it's the first day they're playing the clarinet. And like, two things I've encountered that always like blow me away is every now and then one kid will like, he'll like blow into his clarinet and he'll get just the most spectacular, rich, multiphonic. And you're just like, you just want to be like, dude, how'd you do that? I need, I need to know exactly like what you were doing. And the kid's like, I don't know, I was blowing into the clarinet. And then every now and then you get a kid who immediately has really, really good tone. Yeah. Right. I mean, and usually it goes away, but I mean, like, it's just kind of like, it's just like, just this, like, you know, like when it's really cloudy, but there's like that hole in the clouds and there's that one little ray of sunlight coming through. Yes. Right. It's like, it's like that. There's like just this beautiful tone for one second and then it goes away. So, I mean, and these kids are playing on like the bottom end Yamaha student model clarinet. So I think there might be some validity to that. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thing. Like, you know, and maybe this is what we're lucky in that we'll be one of the last, uh, professions to be truly replaced by robots is <laughs> like, cause until we know exactly what you have to do to get that perfect tone that everybody wants yeah. or just you know, consistent tone, then, uh, I think the robots will have a time. Uh, It'll be a time. long time before like the, the sensitivity of a musician and intent can be replaced by a robot. But you know, one more thing along those lines is that, um, you know, although I do agree that perhaps the, the material does not play as much of a, uh, um, role as we sort of think the one thing that I do sort of think is true. And I, I think I talked about this with Josh Redmond or Tom Kamichik on one of the episodes um, featuring Jadario. And uh, we sort of talked about how 80% of the, what, what you do is the player, right? But you can't really go that last 20% without the right equipment. Oh, um, so it, it might be true that you could make a very, you know, cheap plastic clarinet sound pretty darn good because you know what you're doing, but you couldn't, perform with it that extra 20% that you need out of the real quality instrument um, 
And that, I, I think that's, that's very true. I mean, again, a ligature will get you by, but this one will let you play with just that little extra ounce of artistry that, that is really important for someone at this level. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so speaking of ligatures, shall we go oh, on to the man, next one? That was one? a great segue. Eh? We couldn't yeah. have planned that any better. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's a, which is the best type of ligature? Plastic, metal, string, zip tie. Um, I believe rubber wa- washers are another option, um, as well as leather. Leather is a very popular ligature choice. And upon first glance, it seems to be that uh, we kind of have a tie between metal and whatever works best for you. Um, yeah. Now we're, yeah. Now this is like what you said a second ago about that eighty and twenty. And I remember the kind of first time I went to clarinet fest. You know, there's all these spectacular musicians, and they have like they tell you in the program like what their setup is, like almost down to the strength of reed they're playing on. Which like I don't think that's a productive thing to do. But <laughs> like the thing is like you're listening to hundreds of spectacular clarinetists playing on hundreds of different setups. So yeah. they all sound pretty equally amazing but they're all playing on different gear so it, it really doesn't i don't i think we can agree that it doesn't come down to the gear but it is still interesting to hear um and talk about people's opinions on the different um products now one thing i'd like to mention is that comment from um james sullivan um where he said uh depends if you want you know whatever or just looking to hop on whatever bandwagon is loading up that particular half decade and um what's wrong just, with bandwagoning though let's just focus on that for a second like what if, if something is working and coming if something's good yeah there's trendy, nothing wrong like with that. hop on i'm all i'm, I'm on board yeah <laughs> yeah you know yeah if it works great but yeah. um i think i think we can i think right now the silverstein ligatures are the hottest thing on the market right now that and those ishimori's uh, which seen, one have you seen those um the, the ishimori woodstones are very popular right how now do you, how, how do you spell that uh it's a japanese uh name i s h i m o r i i believe all right yeah here we go let google finish that one for me and these i don't think i've heard or seen at all oh i should let you try one i have one Oh, okay. Let me. I'm just checking out their website at the this moment because I'm I'm always curious about. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. So the yeah, the, the feature with the Ishimori ones is that they basically come in in many many different styles of of plating, and I think even the metal inside is very different. Like you can get solid silver with a rose gold plate, I believe, is one of them. And oh. then the one I have is like, a, yes. I think it's okay. solid copper with like brushed gold or something on the outside. Yeah. Um, so I'm here, I'm here looking, actually, I have seen these, sorry, they have, um, their, uh, K- Kodama ligatures and then they also have their metal ligatures. I think it's the metal ligatures you're talking about. Yeah. Sorry. I'm talking about the metal ones. Those are the ones yeah, that have so kind of taken off. Copper, brass, brass with a gold plate, brushed satin, pink gold, Let's say copper something. I can't. That word it seems to be a little blurry on my computer. That's weird. Solid silver and pink gold. With uh, oh, I think it's solid silver with pink gold. Mm-hmm. Like the the metal is solid silver. Yeah, that's. I have actually seen these. They um, yeah, it's quite it's quite interesting. Um, I mean, I've been playing on a Charles Bay forever, and I got a, I did get a chance to try the um, the lower level Silverstein uh, ligature. Now I thought it was quite good but not really better than the one I was playing on now. Mm-hmm. But then like, I find that the, um, the bamboo string ligatures are also just as good. I mean, I think their like tonguing isn't quite as good as my Charles Bay, but, um, the big complaint I've heard, I mean, lots of people seem to be liking the, uh, metal ligatures. Let's see. We had, uh, this is a, a Dean had mentioned the Charles Bay, the Van Dorn off and the Springs float, Springs floating rail, Oh, actually, now that I think about it, that might be where my missing Spriggs floating rail bass clarinet ligature is. I wonder if Aideen has it. Um, wow, that's, it's been like 10 years. It's too late to get it back now. But uh, that's fine. Um, but yeah, so like, I mean, I'm not a fan of the Van Dorn Optimum. Um, that's the one with like the three interchangeable plates and the screw. Like My only problem with it is it hits my chin. Yeah, it's, yeah. So It's really big. That. And then, yeah, yeah, that screw is massive. Um, like, yeah, I've got quite a beard my too, right? Like, isn't it catching in that? 
Oh yeah, well, you know it might depending on the time of year. It gets, the beard's a little <laughs> shorter in the summer because it gets just gets too warm. But yeah, my other problem with the Vandorm Optimum is is the price. I mean, like, I mean the Silverstein ligatures. You know, the price is up there on those too. But for me, the Van, I think the price for the Vandorm Optimum comes from the three interchangeable plates. And Which I mean, unless everyone you're, loses, I lost them right away. Yeah. So unless you're playing like if you're playing cla- classical and jazz and, you know, you want a different plate that has more flexibility for jazz and a little and one that has less flexibility for classical, then you will be switching out the plates. But I feel that most people just straight up won't like I would never recommend the Optum to a student unless they like had their heart set on it. And because I'd be like, I bet you could find the exact same style of ligature, like with the pressure points provided by the plate for half the cost because you're not paying for those extra two plates. But one thing about the Optimum, which is really good and one reason people like it, is I've heard anyways that one uh, very important part about the ligature is its density. Um, oh, and like the, the density of the metal. And the like the physical weight of it and the dent. Yeah, so the, 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 oh. the Optimum has those two large metal like resonators on the front. Yes. And they do work well. Um, it is also a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous ligature. Um, that silver looks fantastic, but yeah, it's just, like I said, it's not for me just because of the, I don't like the, where the, I wish they made a reversed version, but it maybe wouldn't work. Oh uh, yeah. Well, you wouldn't have be able to do the interchangeable plates the way that, the way it pops out. Yeah, I guess not, but yeah, see, that's kind of the opposite of my ligatures. Cause I'm on the Charles Bay ones and they are like the thinnest, lightest silver you could possibly have. Like like if you drop that thing, the screws are going to like bend it just from the weight of the screws. Like if you mm-hmm. set it down, the thing, it's like one of those like weird, like, like gyroscopic toys. You set it down and unless you set it down on the screws, it's going to flip itself over and onto the screw. So the screws are against the ground. Yeah. Catherine Peters said here, I like metal with either rails such as the Banad inverted or a plate vendor and optimum. And um, she says fabric and leather ligatures feel more muffled. And I, you know, would agree with that, actually. I, I find yeah. that, from my experience, I, I do have a couple, like a BG leather and a couple other ones. You know, I maybe like most clarinetists kind of have a ligature collection. <laughs> I keep it in a box and I kind of, you know, <laughs> sometimes experiment. And uh, how can you not? Ligatures are such a, such a collectible thing. Yeah, and they're, you know, all things considered, they're not overly expensive. Here, um, here's a thought, though. I don't know if everyone else does this, but... Ligatures, I once had a bad experience because I, I actually two on two occasions had an experience like this. Um, but right before my first recital in university, I dropped my, I was a little shaky, I must have been or something. And I was putting my, my, my ligature on my mouthpiece. I dropped it and it was dark in the room I was in and I was looking for it. And in, in my efforts to find it, I stepped on it. Oh, flat so as that a happened pancake, to me. Flat as a pancake. Oh, before your recital? Right before my recital, like I was oh, about to walk on man. stage. So I got it just back to kind of where it would sort of work. And actually, I still have that ligature. I, I actually, I reshaped it by putting it on the mouthpiece kind of and, and then and tightening the hell it. out of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know what? That it sort of inspired me and made me realize that I always had to have a backup. So so now I keep either one of those like, uh, like O-ring things for plumbing or oh, yeah. just a shoelace in my case because I, I figure – actually, now I keep a, a Vientos bamboo because they can just be folded up and tucked in there. Um, yeah. But uh, I always keep a backup ligature because it's it's just so risky. Like, what are you going to do if you lose or drop or break your ligature? And also, the screws can give out get metal fatigue on there, right? So oh, absolutely. What do you use that as was, a backup? Uh, I actually um, use the Ventos bamboo as well now. Yeah. That I have one of those. Just like I just you just stuff it into your clarinet case, and like you don't need to worry about it getting squished or anything. But yeah. I had a I had a similar experience with the ligature getting squished, except I was in like grade seven, and I was like you know like a typical grade seven student fumbling around, and my ligature kind of like bounced out of my hand and across the room, and then a trumpet player stepped on it. Oh God! Always those trumpet players, eh? Yeah, and so I've been holding every single trumpet player to account for the actions of this one trumpet player <laughs> for the last twenty years. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, and I think I think it's I think trumpet players deserve it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I use the Ventos bamboo. But I actually I was at a rehearsal uh, for the marching band that I, I teach, and one of the clarinetists comes up and they're like, ah, "Andrew, I, I left my ligature at home." And like my first question is like, "Like how did you leave your ligature at home?" Right? Like <laughs> I mean, if I was teaching like really young kids, I'd be like, "Okay, well you just obviously forgot to put it back in your case when you were like putting your clarinet away." But like these kids are like sixteen to twenty-two or something like that. So it's like, what do you mean you left your ligature at home? They're like, I don't know. I don't know. I just, it just did. And I was like, all right, well, I looked down at her shoes and 
you know, she's just wearing shoe, like not leather shoelaces, but just regular shoelaces. And I was like, well, you know, in a pinch, anything will do. So I go, all right, well, I'm going to need you to take one of the shoelaces off of your shoe. And she kind of gave me this this look of sheer terror. She's like, oh, my God, I have to wear a shoe without a shoelace? But then um, the section leader was like, oh, actually, I have an extra ligature. And I was like, well, you dodged a bullet this time. Yeah, be prepared. But, Always be prepared. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I, I don't really say it's, like, super important to have, like, a backup ligature. But I think, like, if anything on your clarinet's going to break just from – like wear and tear and use, it's probably going to be your ligature. So like, yeah, like an extra shoelace or an O-ring or two O-rings, <clears throat> I find works a little better than one O-ring. And those things cost like 75 cents. Oh yeah. You know, I like, I think my favorite comment on here is Peter Siglaris. He says, the best ligature is one that allows the reed to do its job. And I think that the best thing about that answer is it, it covers all the subjective differences that people might have as far as preference of feel, style, price, everything. Like if it holds yeah. the read on there and sounds good and feels good to you, that's the <laughs> best, that's the best one. <laughs> yeah. And I do, I do like uh, Jason um, Adler mentioned, um, which he's the, he's the one who wrote that thesis I was talking about, isn't he? Oh, perhaps. No, like, yeah. No, sorry. That's Thomas, Thomas Aber. Oh, Jason oh, yeah. Adler is not. Uh, Anyway, anyway, but he posted uh, Michael Lonestern's video, the $2 shoelaces or a $70 Van Doren, the ultimate ligature showdown. Yeah, I was and just about to mention this. It's, this is actually what gave me the inspiration for this question. <laughs> oh, excellent. And I think the result is, you know, like the, the clarinet fest thing is you find the gear that gives you the sound that you want and you go with it. And the feel. You know, yes. ligature is so much about the feel. The, the resistance changes and that's a really important part of it, so... Yeah, well, this was great. I'm going to link to as much of the stuff as I can. Man, we mentioned like 100 products, so I'll be linking for a while. But I will try to link to everything that we discussed today um, if you're interested in checking it out. I highly recommend checking out this video of the uh, ligature showdown that um, Michael Lowenstern did. It's really funny, and it, it kind of gets to the point um, that we sort of were just debating here as well. So, And thank you so much to all those people who are contributing on the Clarinet community to the Wednesday debate topics. There's actually one up there right now as we're talking. I'll have to go and check in. And um, if you'd like to be a part of that, please just search Clarinet community on Facebook or go to clarinet.com slash group. Any other last words, Andrew? Um, no, I hope everybody uh, chimes in on the debates and uh, hook us up with some debate questions if you want to uh, start your own discussions. Absolutely. Thanks so much for everything, and I'll talk to you soon, Andrew, maybe in a couple weeks. Sounds good, John. Thanks for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. For free content updates, coupons, and a chance to win giveaways mentioned on the show, please be sure to enter your email address at clarinet.com slash subscribe. The podcast is brought to you in part by the generous support of its listeners. If you'd like to learn how you can help out, please see clarinet.com slash support. Today's episode was brought to you by D'Addario Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds.